Hello and welcome to the next video in your neuroanatomy journey. I am Tanya Chamberlain from the Division of Anatomy here at the University of Leeds and in this video we will be taking a closer look at the visual system. After this lecture and any further necessary study you should be able to describe the anatomical features of the eye and their basic function. Describe the visual pathway from stimulus to the visual cortex. Identify key features of the visual pathway in diagrams and in cadavers. Describe the visual fields and their distribution from the eye to the optic radiation and visual cortex. And describe some of the common anatomical visual pathologies. So first, let's go and have a look at the anatomy of the eye. So the eye can be quite a difficult to get to grips with as there are lots of interesting parts of the eye that form how we see the world. The first part of the eye is the cornea. This is continuous with the sclera, the white part of the eye, and is avascular, receiving its nutrients and O2 requirements from simple diffusion of the aqueous humour beneath it. The cornea is the tra transparent front part of the eye that covers the iris, pupil and the anterior chamber. Along with the anterior chamber and the lens, the cornea refracts light, accounting for approximately two thirds of the total eye optical power. Whilst the cornea contributes to the eye's focusing power, its focus is fixed. Secondly, we have the iris. The iris is a thin, annular structure in the eye responsible for controlling the diameter and the size of the pupil, and thus the amount of eye reaching the retina. The pupil is the eye's aperture, whilst the iris is the diaphragm. The outward or anterior plane of the iris contains dilator muscles which allow the iris to contract and dilate to control the amount of light entering the eye and being intercepted by the retina. We have a lens. The lens is a transparent biconvex structure. Along with the cornea, aqueous humour and the vitreous humour, it refracts the light, focusing it onto the retina. The adjustment of the lens is known as accommodation. The ciliary body is part of the eye that includes the ciliary muscle, which controls the shape of the lens, and the ciliary epithelium, which produces the aqueous humour, that sits in the anterior compartment between the cornea and the lens. The ciliary body joins to the lens by the suspensory ligaments. The suspensory ligament acts to suspend the lens in the eye and stretch and flatten the lens under instruction from the ciliary body, allowing for the accommodation. Briefly mentioned is the sclera, and this is what we associate as being the white part of the eye. It is opaque, fibrous and a protective outer layer of the eye, containing mainly collagen and some crucial elastic fibre. Muscles of the eye attach to the sclera for independent eye movement. That means we don't have to move our head in order to be able to alter our visual field. The choroid is a part of the uvea, the vascular layer of the eye and contains connective tissue. It lies between the retina and the sclera. The innermost structure of the eye is the retina. This is the light sensitive layer of tissue that processes an image within the retina and sends nerve impulses along the optic nerve to the visual cortex to create a visual perception. Light striking the retina initiates a cascade of chemical and electrical events that ultimately trigger nerve impulses that are sent to the various visual fields, various visual centres of the brain through the fibres of the optic nerve. The retina is continuous for the diencephalon of the brain, which is why we consider the eye as being part of the central nervous system. The macula is an oval shaped pigmented area in the centre of the retina. The macula is responsible for central high resolution colour vision that it is possible that is possible in good light. And it is this kind of vision that is impaired if the macula is damaged. At the very centre of the macula is a fovea or impression. 
The optic disc or optic nerve head is the point of exit for the ganglion cells leaving the eye. Because there are no rods or cones overlying the optic disc, it corresponds to a small blind spot in each eye. In order to check for the health of the eye, optometrists and opticians will look in the eye with a series of lights and cameras to visualise the condition of the retina. On this image we can see a healthy retina. We can locate the optic disc, which is this bright region that's indicated the location of the optic nerve, or cranial nerve number two. We can also see the macula, or the macula lutea as it's sometimes referred to. This is the area associated with focused central vision. When we focus on something, the focus part is projected directly onto the macula. The rest of, or the periphery of the image is being projected onto the rest of the retina, obviously minus the optic disc which has no pigmented epithelium for the detection of images. The very central portion of the retina is called the fovea and this is where the super focused central image is projected to. For instance, in the case of reading or when trying to thread a needle. On this image, we can see the photograph of a retina which is in less than healthy condition. This retina belongs to somebody with diabetic retinopathy and this case is very severe. When we consider the common pathologies caused by diabetes, we know that uncontrolled blood sugars have a highly detrimental effect on the small capillaries systemically. So we see issues with the kidneys that rely on capillaries to produce urine. In extreme situations, we see issues regarding the necrosis of digits, particularly in the toes, because they aren't receiving adequate perfusion from the damaged capillaries. Well, we also see the effects in the eye, as here. We can see the microaneurysms of the vasculature in the eye. It results in these little cotton wool spots and hemorrhages, which in turn damage the delicate tissues and starve them of oxygen. In this image, we can see another common condition affecting the eye. This is dry age macular de degeneration. It is more common amongst the older population with a worldwide prevalence of about 9% and accounting for the main cause of blindness in working age people. Here we can see it's largely affecting the macular region. As predicted, because it affects the macula, we expect that these individuals would experience a central vision loss. Light striking the retina initiates a cascade of chemical and electrical events that ultimately trigger nerve impulses that are sent to various visual centres of the brain through the fibres of the optic nerve. Neural signals from the rods and cones undergo processing by other neurons whose output takes the form of action potentials in the retinal ganglion cells whose axons form the optic nerve. Several important features of visual perception can be traced to the retinal encoding and the processing of light. There are 10 layers of the retina, but these layers can be grouped into four main processing stages. Photoreception, transmission to bipolar cells, transmission to ganglion cells, which all con also contain photoreceptors, and the photosensitive ganglion cells, with their transmission along the optic nerve. At each synaptic stage, a horizontal and amacrine cells are also laterally connected. The non-neuronal cells are the pigmented epithelial cells of the retina. These cells respond to wavelengths of light striking them, and a series of proteins that excite the neuron cells cause a cascade of neurotransmitters. The pigmented epithelium connects with photoreceptors, which are the beginning of the neuronal cells. We will focus on these today. These photoceptors are the rods and cones, which is probably terms that you have heard of before. 
The central retina predominantly contains cones, whilst the peripheral retina predominantly contains rods. In total, the retina has about 7 million cones and 100 million rods. At the centre of the macula is a foveal pit, which is where the cones are narrow and long, and are arranged in a hexagonal mosaic, the most dense, in contradistinction to the much fatter cones that are located more periphery in the retina. Though the rod and cones are mosaic of sorts, transmission from receptors to bipolar to ganglion cells is not quite so direct. Since there are about 150 million receptors and only 1 million optic nerve fibres exist, convergence and thus a mixing of signals must occur with the rods converging more than the cones. Moreover, the horizontal action of the horizontal and amacrine cells allow one area of the retina co to control another, i.e. they are stimulating and inhibiting each other. Here is a summary table. Pause the video if you wish to recap this information or continue on as we move on to the next learning objective. So now let's have a look at the anatomy of the visual pathway. Ultimately, the visual pathway is going to end with the synapsing of the cortex. The visual cortex is located in the occipital lobe, with the occipital pole and the upper and the lower banks of the calcarine sulcus being the primary projection area. For the purposes of this video, we will only be concentrating on the primary visual cortex and not the association area. On this image, we are looking at a ventral aspect of the brain. We can locate the olfactory tracts, which help us to determine the anterior and posterior ends of the brain. The image on the right is a sketch to help us simplify the pathway of the visual system. First up are the nerves. These are the optic nerves or cranial nerve number two. These carry the special sensory information from the retina. The optic nerves are made up of the axons of the second order nerves, the ganglion cells, that are travelling within the optic canal that is not visible on this image. These fibres come together and form the optic chiasm, where there will be a crossover of some of the fibres, but we will come on to that shortly. After the optic chiasm, these nerves are going to continually continue posteriorly as the optic tract. These second order neuron ganglions, ganglion cells will then synapse onto a region of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus. The third order cells fan out as an optic radiation and project onto the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe. So as with some of the pathways we have looked at, the visual pathway is all made up of a three neuron chain, beginning in the retina and ending in the visual cortex. The difference is, however, that all of this takes place in the central nervous system, as the eyes, or more specifically the retina, are located within the CNS. The pigmented epithelium receives light and transmit the signals via chemical messages to the photoreceptors, that are, the cones or the rods. These then excite the first order bipolar cells of the retina, which excite the second order ganglion cells of the retina. The axons from these ganglion cells converge as the optic nerve or cranial nerve 2 and travel backwards towards the brain. The left and the right optic nerve merge at a place called the optic chiasm, where some of these fibres will cross over. More of that to follow. Remember that these are the second order ganglion cells. These second order ganglion cells continue as the optic tracts and eventually synapse onto the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, where the third order neurons fan out as the optic radiation and project onto the primary visual area of the occipital lobe. Let's break each part of this visual pathway down. 
The optic nerve is constructed of axons of the second order ganglion cells, as these are continuous with the diencephalon and part of the central nervous system. They too have a meninges wrapped to the, around their length. Therefore, they also have cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. Travelling through the core of the optic nerve, we also have a central retinal artery and vein. The problem with this setup is that if there is a problem with the CSF, this has a potential to have a knock on effect on the eye. This can be seen in the case of papillodema. If there is an increased CSF production or an increased intracranial pressure resulting in the squeezing of the CSF, this can be transmitted within the optic nerve because it is continuous. With this, the optic nerve can compress the retinal veins and prevent venous drainage from the retina. If you look at the bottom image, you can see this increased pressure can be seen around the optic disc, causing a bulging of the optic disc, reduced venous drainage and leading to blurred vision. Also experienced are headaches, drowsiness and vomiting. Now we've had a look at the visual pathway. How does an image within our visual field project onto the visual cortex? While well, much the same as when we looked at somatotopy and the motor homunculus, the visual pathway also has one of these maps. It is called a retinotopy. To summarise what is on the retinotopy map, we have to appreciate that the image is going to be flipped upside down and mirrored. This means that the left half of the visual field will go to the right hemisphere and the right half of the visual field will go to the left hemisphere. The upper half of the visual field will go onto the lower bank of the calcarine sulcus and the lower visual field will go onto the upper, bound, uh, upper bank of the calcarine sulcus. But why? Well, that will be explained in a second. When discussing vision, it is important to understand that the visual field and how it differs from the image presented to the retina. The visual field is the entire area that can be seen by a patient without the movement of their head, with their eyes fixed on one point. This fixed point is the region of the visual field that is being projected onto the fovea within the macula. Much like when you play with magnifying glasses, you manipulate the light through a lens. The image can be inverted and mirrored. But the same thing is happening with the lens of our eye and our cornea. They are refracting the light and it is unfortunate that this refraction of light produced by an image is flipped upside down and mirrored. But it's okay because our brain knows this and it knows how to process the image within the cortex. So if we look at this image here, we can see that the visual field of the swans has been flipped upside down and mirrored. But the centre of each image, as determined by the fovea, remains the same. It is still a shadow of the wings of the bird with its eyes closed. Let's imagine that we are looking at this image with the person with the long brown hair sat in the middle of our visual field. We are focused on their face. This is the fixation point and the part that is projected onto the fovea in the macula. From that fixation point, we can produce a grid that divides the visual field into four quadrants. The visual field is divided into left and right hemifields by that vertical line, then divided into quadrants by a horizontal line. Now this image is seen in both eyes. The teal hemisphere represents the left side of this visual field and the purple represents the right half of the visual field. Now this is where it can be a little confusing. So if you need to have a break and recharge your brain, now would be a good time to pause the video 
so we don't get lost as we move on to our next steps. So if you stayed, I'm assuming that you're ready. Each eye has its own visual field. It has a nasal field and a temporal field, or sometimes known as the lateral field. On the left eye, the left half of the visual field is projected onto the left nasal field, as we can see here. Whilst the right half of the field is projected onto the temporal field. In the right eye, the reverse is true. The left half of the image that we are seeing is projected onto the temporal field, whilst the right half of the image we are seeing is projected onto the nasal fields. So if we look at the pathways of the left and the right eye, we have the left side of the visual field near the nose and the right half of the image near the temples. Looking at the right eye, the reverse is true. The left half of the image is projected onto the temple side, whilst the right side of the image is projected onto the nose side of the eye. This is because of refraction of the cornea, aqueous humour and the lens. As the optic nerves course down to the chiasm, you remember that I said there is a crossing over of some fibres. Well, that's what happens. The fibres of the nasal region cross over. So the tier one of the left eye crosses over to the right side of the brain. And the purple one from the right eye crosses over to the left side of the brain. So now we have all of the left visual field over on the right side of the brain and all of the right side, right visual field on the left side of the brain. But that's not all of it. Remember how we said that the visual field is constructed of four quadrants? Well, so far we have only accounted for the left and the right. But what about the top and the bottom? For this image of the lateral aspect of the brain, we are only going to follow the course of one of the eyes, as it's the same in both eyes. The visual field is divided into left and right hemispheres, but let's ignore this now and only concentrate on the upper and the lower visual fields. When looking at an image in the visual field, the upper part of that image is projected onto the lower part of the retina. And when looking at a lower part of the image, this is projected onto the upper part of the retina. This is because the light has been refracted, like playing with a magnifying glass. Those fibres from the upper ganglions, reading the lower visual field, travel back and will synapse on the lateral geniculate ganglion and are then projected onto the upper bank of the calcarine sulcus. The lower ganglion fibres, reading the upper visual field, synapse onto the lateral geniculate ganglion and are projected onto the lower bank of the calcarine sulcus. So now we have, we have demonstrated how these images have flipped and mirror that image, we can look at the regions of the primary visual cortex that arranges this image. The fovea is our fixation point and that is projected most posteriorly, right at the tip of the occipital pole. Spreading more anteriorly represents more and more periphery of that image. So the centre of the forehead of that central person would be projected right here, and the rest of the macula within this space here. Whilst moving more towards the periphery of the image, we are moving more and more anteriorly. 
If we look back at our sketch from the beginning, we can see that each eye is looking at this image. Let's add some colour in to see the visual fields. The retina through refraction is presented with an upside down mirrored image. The left eye sees the green zero and divide on the nasal retina, whilst the right eye sees the green field on the temporal retina. The nasal fibres cross over, so the image from the left nasal field is transferred onto the right optic tract where it synapses with the lateral geniculate nucleus. The divide symbol has been read by the upper retina and then projected onto the upper bank of the calcarine sulcus. And the zero is seen on the lower retina and so is projected onto the lower bank of the calcarine sulcus. If we follow the print quadrants now, the image has been flipped and mirrored by the ret onto the retina by refraction at the cornea and the lens. So the left eye sees the pink on the temporal visual field and the right eye sees the pink on the nasal visual field. The nasal fibres cross over, so the right nasal field takes the pink to the left hemisphere. These fibres synapse at the lateral geniculate nucleus and the lower equal image projects onto the upper bank of the calcarine sulcus and the upper multiplication sign is projected onto the lower bank of the calcarine sul sulcus. The resulting outcome will be this. So now we've looked at the pathways from image to cortex, let's look at a disruption in that pathway. We have a little bit of terminology to address first. Scotoma is the act of a localised patch of blindness. This might be due to diabetic retinopathy as we saw earlier. Scotoma blindness is usually resulting from damage to the retina or light being unable to reach the retina. This could be from injury to the eye such as ulceration of the cornea or exposure to chemicals. Macular degeneration or part of the retina being directly affected by a pathology. The rest of the visual field will be largely unaffected. When we look at visual pathway disturbance involving the optic nerve or any of the fibres further back in the brain, we can lose whole chunks of visual field, sometimes a whole quadrant, sometimes a visual field of the whole eye. We describe the loss as a of a quadrant as anopia. Hemianopia would be half of a visual field loss. Quadrant inopia would describe a quadrant of the visual field loss. The presentation of this loss can help us to determine exactly where the lesion or the pathology is located. If the anopia is described as harmonious, that means that the visual field losses are the same on both sides. If it is heteronymous, this means the visual field losses are different on each side. But what does that look like? The first image here displays a type of heteronymous hemianopia. The visual information obtained by the temporal side falls onto the medial or the nasal retina. The optic nerve is transferred to the optic chiasm through the nasal retina. The nasal retina fibres cross over at the chiasm. If there is a compression at the central part of the chiasm where these fibres cross over, such as with a pituitary tumour, we would lose temporal visceral field. In the second image, we can see an example of harmonious hemianopia. This would likely be caused by a posterior cerebral artery occlusion or an isolated infection of the left calcarine sulcus. 
And that was a lot of words and a lot of confusing imagery. So well done if you've made it this far. You should now feel more confident in tackling your learning objectives for today. So you now should be able to describe the anatomical features of the eye and their basic function. Describe the visual pathway from stimulus to visual cortex and identify key features of the visual pathway in diagrams and in cadavers. Describe the visual fields and their distribution from the eye to the optic radiation and the visual cortex. And then describe some common visual pathologies. 